I'm going to be in John chapter 10, just for a few minutes. John chapter 10, yeah, looks good. And then while you're there, you know, um, go keep your finger there at John 10 and then go to Hebrews 5. And this is where we were last week. Hebrews chapter 5. And I'll mark that. Verse, I believe it's 11. Verse 11, chapter 5 of Hebrews. But I want to start with John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, the enemy talks about the thief. And in verse 10, he says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, that's what the enemy's out to do. Now, you can... Some will say this is putting it in context. He's talking about um, people who use the gospel for their own gain because he's talking about the sheepfold. Christ is the true shepherd. There's false shepherds out there. And the false shepherds are out to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. And But who's motivating those false shepherds? The Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. Every evil thing that's done has its roots in the enemy. So whether you want to look at this as false shepherds, and you can, but understand the principle is still the same. The enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. However, when you read on, Jesus says, I have come that you will have life, and they that have it more abundantly. Amen. So in the Amplified, let me read it to you there. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. And I come, Jesus, that they may have and enjoy life, have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The, this is not by osmosis, this abundant life. See, a lot of people think, oh, I'm saved, and then automatically this stuff just starts coming to us. But there has to be an aspect of, yes, it's by grace through faith. However, that grace is working in us, aligning us up with what God is saying and doing. There is no way in the world, and, and, and this really goes into last week's message after I make this statement. There is no way in the world that God is going to give you this abundant life to the flow, till you're full, till it's overflowing, if you are out there doing your own thing in your own strength. All right. There's there's just I I I looked at the Bible, I've been doing this for years, I can't see how you can have the lens or the mindset that you take this scripture, abundant life, grace, yes, and then go out and do your own thing and expect God to, to be the one blessing everything that you are doing. He's only going to bless what He is doing through you. Amen. And so it's really interesting because now I want you to take it up Hebrews 5. You're, Many, some of you are going to go, I know that to be true. Many of you are going to scratch your head and go, wow, I never thought it like that. And the ones that are going to hate what I'm about to say is going to be pastors. Preachers and teachers are going to hate the worst what I'm about to say. Because as I was meditating on this message the last couple weeks, especially this week, and he, let's just read Hebrews 5 and let's look at verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. But understand, we're not talking about the tree of knowledge and good and evil. That's a no-no. That is not what that means. That's what Adam and Eve did 
They said, we don't need God to lead and guide us. If we can eat from this tree, we will know how to guide ourselves by the knowledge of what is good and do and what is evil and avoid. You think God, you, if you really, if you don't have the mind of Christ here and you're carnal in your thinking, it would, it would make sense God give us this tree. Why would you hold that tree oh, the ability to know what's good so I can do it and the ability to know what's evil so I can avoid it? But that's not what he's talking about here because we know that tree is bad. The good, the good of it's bad and the evil of it's bad. But look what it says here. Now, I, my, my translation here is the New King James, good and evil. Does anybody have anything different than good and evil? Or does everybody say good and evil? Well, the tree of knowledge of what? Good and evil. I have, we have a problem here. If that's bad, why, 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 am I, why do I need to exercise my senses to know good and evil when that's the very thing they got in trouble for doing? So it can't mean good and evil in the respect of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It has to mean something else. And last week we told you what it means. They discern, they have their senses discerned, the mature. Only the mature can do this. Has their senses so they can discern what is God and what is not God. We're not into good and evil anymore. We're into what's God and what's not God. That's it. I, you know, a good thing about raising kids is if I can sit there and go, oh, you can't smoke and you can't cuss and you can't, you can't, and you just give them all this list of rules. Or you can say, this isn't what God is doing in this family. Now what's happened is you, you're taking a kid's focus off of a list of do's and don'ts and onto a person who can speak to us. Amen. And I'd rather have a relationship with a person who's speaking than a piece of paper or stones, commandments, telling me what to do. That's right. See, they can rebel against, they can rebel against rules. But when you invite them into a relationship with a person, that person therefore starts having an influence on me. Good and evil, or let's put the Ten Commandments, cannot influence me. But a personal relationship with Jesus is what influences me. Not rules, but a person. Does that make sense? Now here's where pastors are going to get mad at me. Because I'm going to expose them. Because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking this week, um, I had a pastor... Um, uh, like something, one of the, one of the messages. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember which one it was, but I thought, oh well, they're obviously watching. All right. So then, as I'm preparing last week and this week, and I know this this particular individual, and I'm like, I know they're going to have a problem with this message. See, when you when you have pastoral friends and you know what they believe, and they're watching. You, you can pretty much, they're not going to like this. They're not going to agree with this. Here's why. It's because this individual, and he represents the majority of pastors. I know this to be true. Is they do not have a discernment of what's God and what's not. They're sticking with their guns of what's good and evil. I'm going to tell you why. I, as a pastor, if I stick with my guns of good and evil... I don't have to seek the Holy Spirit. I can live off of this tree and go, hey, we're going to start doing acts of kindness in the neighborhood. Did God tell you to do that? No, 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 no. That's good. How could God not want me to go to door to door and do good deeds for people? See, what has happened is pastors watch TV. They go to conferences. And they get these great ideas that come down and shove them down the congregation's throat and make you do the work and finance what he come up with. And you go and say, well, did God tell, is, is, is this what the Lord spoke? What do you mean? Why wouldn't God want you to do that? Why wouldn't God want us as a church to go and get into this ministry? Or let's say I came back and said, we're doing a food pantry. Because I saw that you can get, build a church feeding people. Now, God didn't tell me to do that. But is feeding people a good thing? Yeah. But is it what God is doing? I can show you and blow your mind things Jesus did that wasn't you you would consider good. Let me give me throw a couple at you. Is it a good thing to visit people in prison? Yeah. 
Isn't it, doesn't it say somewhere that yeah. you go to prisons? Well, why didn't Jesus go visit his own cousin in prison? He never visited John the Baptist while he was in jail. That's a good thing. Is it a good thing to obey your mother and father? Because with this promise is long life. His mother says, do something. This, the, 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 the waters, or the, wet, the, the wine has ran out. And he says, well, then my time is not now. Now, he eventually did it because I believe he heard the father. Because he said, I only do what I hear my father. But he didn't do it because Mary said so. Isn't that dishonoring Mary? Or how about this? Hey, your mom's out there with your brothers and sisters. And they're standing in line because there's no more room in the church for them or the house. He didn't say, oh, God, bring them on in. He said, well, these that are here are my mother's brothers and sisters. What an offense to his own mother who's just standing out there in line in the heat. So I can show you over and over and over things you, because it's good, thinks Jesus ought to do, and he didn't. So I can see pastors just... See, every Easter, they know what to do. Yeah. Get the Easter eggs. Put the billboards all over the place of your church. And on and on, we know what to do. We don't, we don't have to seek God. We have the tree of good. Forget evil, because these pastors aren't going to do evil. I mean, if they do, they hide it. Let's just stay the tree of knowledge of good. I got that down. I know how to advertise. I know how to draw a crowd. I know how to give away free things. To draw a crowd. I know how to do all that. I don't need the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me. And me having to sit there and wait on the Spirit. I know what to do. I'm a pastor. I went to Bible college. I went to seminary. I know how to build a church. I know how to lead people. And you're the biggest one. You're the biggest problem in the church if that's your mentality. I guarantee you they get offended at this message. Because what I'm telling them to do is sit down, shut up, and quit doing all your work. And hear God. Amen. Discern what God is doing in this season, in your church, in your individual life, and then line up with it. But if God ain't in it, I don't care how good it is, it, he, ain't, he ain't got you doing it. No. So, so I'm sitting there thinking, I guarantee you pastors are the biggest ones who are not doing this. Because they, they think they know. They think they've got to do a bunch of things to keep the machine going. Every year they've got to come up with four or five things a year. I was in it. We'd have meetings. I had a church of around 600 people. We had meetings. What? we fill the calendar up from January to December. Okay, we're going to have a, a, a singles conference. We're going to have a marriage conference. We're going to have an evangelistic outreach. We're going to do this. And, we, and I'm sitting there thinking, are you guys even? I, was, I wasn't a pastor. I was an associate pastor. I'm sitting there thinking, is anybody here in God? Because we do this every year. We don't seek God. We know how to have church. We're not discerning what's God and what's not God. We have, we have a love affair of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. That's a whole other story, but I thought that would be interesting. So let's go, because let me prove this scripture in another way. Isaiah, we looked at this last week, but I'm only kind of refreshing your memory. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. And we're talking about having our five senses which is part of our mind, emotions, and will, exercised by the Spirit to discern what the Spirit is doing, not what you can see in the natural and do. So Isaiah chapter 11, this is Isaiah prophesying about the way Jesus is going to minister and live among his people before God. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. I'll just start at verse 1 because you'll see who he's talking about. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's Jesus. Now look at verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge. And then it goes down and says, and he'll decide with fairness, not by what his physical eyes and ears hear and see, but by what he sees happening in the heavens, in the spirit realm. Here's what I want you to see here. Go back to verse 2. He says here, I want you to notice something. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. 
This is because the Spirit is on him. He can't do this without the Spirit. Then it says the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of understanding. The Spirit of counsel. And the Spirit of strength. Spirit of knowledge. See, he's not going to be able to do this without the presence of the Spirit on him. Remember when John the Baptist baptized him and the Spirit came down? Yeah. Came on him. Because it was at that point on he went into the ministry. So the Spirit had to be on him. The Spirit was in him because he's God. He was born of the Spirit. He wasn't born of the two males, come, the male and female coming together. He wasn't born that way. That's why Mary was born of a virgin. She had the Spirit in her that gave uh, Jesus to her. And so he was born without a natural father because he had a heavenly father. But he, had, he was born to the Spirit. So he was spirit and body and flesh. Uh, spirit, soul, and body. However, before he went into the ministry, because no, he couldn't become a rabbi until he was like 30 years old, but that's when the Spirit of God came on him. So we just not have the Spirit in us. That's the born-again experience. We need to have the Spirit on us. Amen. Now let me show you what that means, what that looks like. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to hurry up and get through this introduction. Because I want you to see that this is only this abundant life can only be the abundant life can only happen to you when the spirit is involved. Take the spirit out, there is no abundant life. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 10. As to this salvation, this is what you and I have, this salvation. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, they made careful search and inquiry, seeking, verse 11, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ Within them, where's the Spirit of Christ? In them. Within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who, now watch this, that are preaching the gospel to you with the Holy Spirit sent from above. So they have the Holy Spirit in them, but now they're going to preach the gospel with the Holy Spirit that's been sent down from above. And you find that fulfillment in Acts chapter 1 when he said, tarry in Jerusalem till the Spirit comes. So we have to have and understand that the only way, and God has offered this to us, have, our, have success and prosperity in the ministry and in our lives, this, oh, this overflowing, abundant life, John 10.10 10 talks about, is with the Holy Spirit. You're not, this is why it doesn't happen by osmosis. Everything that comes to us has to come to us by way of the Spirit. It does not come on our natural ability, our human wisdom. That's why he had to have the spirit of wisdom. It doesn't come with human understanding. That's why he had to have the spirit of understanding. It doesn't come by what you can see and ascertain. It comes by having your eyes opened by a revelation. It doesn't come by hearing someone say, do this, do that. It comes by when the Spirit opens your eyes, speaks something to you, and your eyes are open to it. Grace is there. writes it on your heart, and it becomes part of your fabric, the being, your, your inner man, and you're able to walk in it. However, let's move on because that's just, that's just an introduction. So, let's get back to, and let me, look, let me show you the two examples again. He said that, and we're going to focus on eyes and ears. What, he, what his eyes see and what his ears hear. Because that's what Isaiah 11 focuses on. Now remember, this is still part of your mind, your physical mind, emotions, which basically control your will. Alright, so he says in Isaiah 11, he's going to have physical eyes, like you and I. And he's going to see the things you see. But he's not going to be ruled by what he sees. He's going to be ruled by what the Lord shows him from heaven, not what he sees here on earth. Why do you think if Jesus, 
uses this when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And man, he, and, and I'm telling you, this revolutionized my life of, around 2013. And that is, on earth, and we'll develop this again because I'm not letting this go down the road. On earth, where? As it is where? In heaven. Heaven. So what you see can either originate on earth, and everything you see is on earth. Come on. But that's not what that's not how Jesus is going to live his life. He's going to live his life by what he sees happening in the heavens, not what's happening on earth. You can have a nice car, and someone says, hey, I'll give you this car half price. Now your eyes see that it's pretty, it's a, almost a brand new car. Your ears hear half price. What's your will going to do? He just stirred your emotions, your mind's thinking 90 miles an hour. My God, I could turn this thing over if I if I don't want to buy, if I don't want to keep it. I could you all of a sudden see what you're 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 operating in the natural. And Jesus, by that prophecy, said, He's not going to walk a natural life. I don't care how much you try to mold him into it, he will not do it. So he's only going to discern. What he hears and sees the Father's doing. So if someone offers you a, almost a brand new car half price, you're going to have, your job is not to go, oh my God, this is the blessing of God. It, it sounds good. It, it's good, so let's, it must be God. Not always. It, even, it doesn't even matter that, well, he's, maybe he's keeping me from a limit. I don't want even you to have that motivation. What if that was a perfect deal? What if that car is not a lemon? What if that car would have served you for the next 20 years and hardly have any problems? It's one of the best that that particular company would put out. It doesn't matter. What matters, is it God? Is that what he's doing in my life? And don't tell me he won't test you. He tested Abraham with his son Isaac. He's going to test you with all kinds of things. Yep. So why? So, so he's trying to get us to the place of his son. Where we will only discern what the spirit is doing, not what our natural eyes and natural ears are going to hear. And that means you get phone calls. Hey, come over here. Hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do that. Here's a good deal. Here's a good business deal. Here's the, none, you, you can't just, you have to stop and say, Lord, what are you doing? What's happening in heaven? What's originating in heaven? I'm tired of seeing what's on earth. I'm not making my decisions on earth anymore. I'm making them from heaven on earth. But what we do is we see what's happening on earth and try to go to heaven to get the blessing. Yeah. Oh God, make this happen on earth so we go to God in heaven so he bless what we want on earth. And it doesn't work that way. He said on earth as it is in heaven. Earth takes its cues from heaven. Heaven does not take its cues from earth. I don't care how much you want something. If it originates on earth, you ain't getting it from heaven. John the Baptist said in John chapter 3, John the Baptist said this, if it doesn't come from heaven, it's not mine to have. Amen. Make sense? Yeah. So we have to discern this. So here, let's look at Jesus. He's in a boat, and the disciples are there. We, we look, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recap last week real quick so we can get into the new. Uh, and so the storm comes. The boat's sinking. They're taking water out. What their eyes see, they hear the storm. They hear the winds. They see the water. And they look to Jesus, and he's sleeping. And you think, how in the world could he do that? Well, he's God. No, yeah, but he's not going by what he hears and sees in the natural. What he heard and saw before the storm was his father saying, get into that boat and go to the other side. And he knew that if, that was what the if that's what heaven's doing, that's what's going to happen. And no storm or water was ever going to sink that boat. I mean, that water could have filled clear to the, to the rim and the supernatural power of God would have kept that boat afloat because the word of the Lord overrides his own creation. The word of the Lord is sustaining this earth right now and, and all the universe and all the planets are being sustained according to Colossians chapter 1 by the word of his power. Think about that. We may not get there, but I'll write it down. Word, not, not the power of his word, but the word of his power is how it's translated. 
So what am, what am I seeing here? Wait a minute. If the Spirit of God has to be on my eyes, the Spirit of God has to be in my ears, and the Spirit of God has to be on what God's Word is saying, because I'm, I'm seeing a, a pattern here. It's called the power of God. And this walk cannot minus the power of God. The church today is so afraid of the supernatural that they have completely run to the natural. They look to their own abilities. They look to their own ways and means. They, they, they read their books. They get their wisdom from the world. They get their cues from other people. And they make all their decisions. They, they, they pattern their life after what the wisdom of the world. And you can do life without God. People do it every day. Millionaires have gotten millionaires without God. Without the power of God. So why not? Do I really need to? Absolutely. If you're born again, everything depends upon the power of God. Amen. The power of God to, to discern the, the senses. But see, I'm not talking about this, 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 this senses that you're exercising to discern God or not. That's not something you can learn. This is the beauty of it. This is not, there's not a book I can give you to show you how to, to exercise your senses. It is by the power of God that you exercise those senses. That means God's got to come on your body and your eyes and ears, your whole being, and lead and guide you. And that's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And we're, we're acting like the Spirit... I had a conversation this morning with a guy. And he, and he was brought up not knowing to pray to Jesus. He's not, he's not, not, he just didn't really understand the Trinity. Wasn't, and so he was telling me now he understands praying to Jesus now and not just to God, that he understands Jesus is the advocate, all that. And I'm like, okay, so what are you going to do with the Holy Spirit? And I'm not going to put him on the spot, so I answered it because he, he, I knew he didn't know. I said, you can't leave the Spirit out. The Spirit is the very reason God's given us to show us what to pray for and how to pray. I said, I, I said how many times, you're, you're, you're excited about going to Jesus, but are you going to Jesus with what you want and how you want it and when you want it? Or are you going to Jesus by inspiration of the Spirit telling you what the Father's doing? I don't want to pray what heaven's not up to. Do you? That's all. And again, that's another thing that will kill, that, that pastors won't like. That all your praying may have been for nothing. You don't think it does? James says we ask amiss. Why didn't we receive? We asked amiss. What does he mean? We asked something he wasn't involved in. So here we go, telling God in heaven what we want on earth. That's, not, that's backwards. We don't go to, to heaven to tell God what we want on earth. We go from earth to find out what he's doing in heaven to come back down here and do it on earth. And everybody's prayer is, God, this is what I want. And because it's good, it must be God. That's how we get away with it. That's the curse of that damn tree of the not because we get away. We don't need the discernment of the Spirit. It's good, it's God. No, it's not. The whole Bible's filled with good is not God. Example after example. Yeah. So that's why the Holy Spirit is given. So now put that aside. That's the introduction. Now, what I want you to zero in on today, in the few minutes we've got left, I want you to zero in on that this walk includes, it does not exclude, it's not even an option, the power of God. And you find out in Romans chapter 1 where he says the power of God, well, let's just look at it because I want you to see it. It won't take long to get there. Go to Romans because we're going to go to Romans anyway here in a few minutes. Go to Romans chapter 1. We already showed you over and over that the preaching of the cross is the power of God. But look what he says here in Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. This gospel does not exclude the power, and you can get cute with your worldly wisdom and try to make God fit in your natural box. It's not going to happen. To, ex to exclude the power of God is to exclude the supernatural, to exclude the Holy Spirit, who is power. Go to Acts. That's, a, that's the book over. Go to Acts chapter 1. I want you to see this. Verse 
Verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive what? Huh? I, all translations will say the same. Verse, one, verse 8, chapter 1, book of Acts. Jesus speaking. This is in red. This is after his resurrection. But you shall receive what? Power. Uh, shouldn't you think that's something we use if we received it? Don't you think that's something that if God said don't leave town without it? It's not a credit card. You know, the, the advertisement don't leave without it, whatever that is. Don't, no, he says, don't you, don't, do not do anything and don't go anywhere. You are not qualified. You're not equipped yet. Yes, I've d died. I'm risen. You're born again. It's all good. But you are not equipped to do anything until what? He Holy says, Spirit you God. shall receive power when what? The Holy, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. you got to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And then you shall be my witnesses. Then you're going to go out into the outermost parts of the earth. But again, you have to understand, we have to have this power. Or there's no abundant life. No abundant life. Now go to Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to give you some um, natural stories that have spiritual truths that back them up. These stories were, I mean, Romans and, um, shoot, I don't remember. Romans and Corinthians, especially Romans, it says these things weren't written for them. These things didn't happen just for them. Talking about the people in the Old Testament. These things were written. They happened and were written for you today who's reading this. Because you're going to draw spiritual truths out of these natural stories. Ezekiel chapter 37. Then we'll start at verse um, 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by what? See, we, all, we just jump right into this story and read right over that. You, if you want to, you want to write in your Bible, circle the word spirit. That's key. This cannot happen without the spirit. And automatically when the spirit came, he brought me out by the spirit. That means he is in the supernatural realm. Anytime the spirit's on you, you are not in the physical realm anymore. So the hand of the Lord was upon me. This is Ezekiel. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of dry bones. And he caused me to pass among these bones round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were what? Now, they weren't dry. They were very dry, meaning that it, it's bad. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now put some flesh and blood on this, not on the bones, but on the story. Let's say you're out in the woods, and I know this has happened to all of us at one time or another. We're out in the woods, and maybe an animal's been out there for years, and you see the bones of that animal. You don't see it a lot of times, but I've seen it enough to know that that happens. And so, you know, as kids we saw that, ooh, was that a dog, was that with it? Now can you imagine if one of your friends says, hey, Greg, can these bones live? Come on, man. We're, we're on earth. What kind of sci-fi are you throwing at me? I'm, I'm smart. That's a stupid question. We're not even going to deal with it. You're an idiot. Move on. Well, come on. God takes this man, sets him in a valley full of dry bones, and these are not animals. These are human beings. And he says, Son of man, can these bones live? Verse 3. O Lord... God, thou knowest, at least he didn't say, come on, no way. He said, uh, I'm talking to God. We're in the spirit realm. I'm having a vision here. I don't know what's going on, Lord. Only you know if these bones can live. And at verse 4, again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, there's no way... Many of us would do that because why? Our natural eyes and understanding gets in the way. There's no way. I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying that. See, here's why I, I feel this is, this is vitally 
imperative today. And I wish more people were here. And I hope they watch it. Because this is huge. Is that if you don't discern your eyes and ears, your five senses, and get your mind renewed and stayed renewed, stay on what God, stay connected to heaven, keep your focus praying heaven, heaven on earth. Is that if you don't do that, God's going to show you things and you're just going to, you're just going to go, well, nope. Because you're going to judge by what you see and hear, like you always have done. Yeah. And, and Ezekiel would have said, nope, those dry bones can't live and you want me to profit? I ain't saying that. I'm not saying that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share that, that vision again. We were working out Monday, and he was telling me that his brother, or I shared this last, this past week, he was telling me that his brother, his brother's knees were hurting. And um, and we just kind of like joked about it because we wake up with pains now. The older you get, you're like, how did that start hurting? I mean, I didn't do nothing. So, you know, anyway, I go home. After we work out, I go home, I stop, get me something to eat, and I'm watching some uh, Christian stuff on TV that I got to catch, teachings I'm catching up on. But anyway, I'm sitting there, and and I kind of like do, do, doze off like we do. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I see these hands going for these knees. Now, autom automatically, I know, okay, what's that? Because I normally when you close your eyes, you don't see nothing. You know, you're, I'm almost passed out at that point, and going, going, in, going, to take a nap, and I see that. So I'm like, well, what's that? In about 30 seconds, 60 seconds at the most, it occurs to me. Oh, wait a minute. He was just telling me about his brother. I wonder if that's connected to that. All right. So I sat there for probably five to ten minutes, maybe even longer, actually. I thought, well, I'll talk. To, I'll, I'll see him Thursday. This is Monday. Well, I ain't got. Wait, 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 we're gonna wait till Thursday. This is Monday. I'm like, well, what if I'm wrong? What if, what if I really didn't see? What if that was just some? And I'm just, I'm like, you know what? I, I would rather be wrong, and then do it than to be right and not do it. I'll take the. But what I'm saying is, my five senses got in the way. Yeah. And I. I didn't, and what, this gets even better, but anyway, all I did is I texted it to him. And then he told his, well, you asked your brother about it, but here's what's interesting. His brother said, yeah, they are getting a little better. So about an hour later, you come back and you spoke it. The minute he spoke it, did they not get even better? Gone. Gone. So you gotta, you got to speak what you hear and what you see. Because what's happening, you are co-laboring with what God's doing. See, that vision I got was God letting me in on heaven so I could see what he wanted to do. The beauty of this is God chooses to include us, co-laborers with him, Amen. so we can see the excitement of what things... Oh, could God have done that on his own? Yeah, yeah. but his brother would have thought, well, they're getting better, and have no clue God was involved. Right. But he let us get involved to, to, with the vision, and then to show his brother so he gets the glory. His brother gets the healing, he gets the glory. Amen. So, so when you put flesh and blood on this, whatever God shows you in your natural eyes, you got to quickly get spiritual eyes. you got to discern, get spiritual discernment on what you're hearing God say and see. And then you're going to have to participate because he showed it to you for a reason. That's right. Son of man, verse 4, what? Prophesy over these bones. Oh, dry bones, what? Hear the word of the Lord. See, this is, this is why this stuff doesn't happen by osmosis. He wants you involved. That means he wants your hearing involved, so you can hear him. Seeing involved, so you can see what's going on in heaven. And then he wants your mouth involved so you can speak what you're seeing and hearing from the heaven. You don't prop, you, if you don't speak it, you don't prophesy it, how's God get it done? That's it. On earth, as it is in heaven, through you and I, our acts. Now it gets, it gets better. Verse 5. Thus says the word of the Lord to these bones. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you're going to come to life. 
That's what the word of the Lord's going to happen. Will say say happen here, and I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. Now he's not talking about literal bones here. This is a metaphor. This is the army of Israel that is clueless to God and worthless in military. They're poor, pathetic, blind, and miserable as a people and as an army. Because they've got to have life breathed back into them. And then what happens? Verse 7. Ezekiel says, I, so I prophesied as God told me to. And as I prophesied there, I, I began to hear a noise. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life, stood on their feet, and became an exceedingly great army. And Ezekiel got to play part of it. God just could have, God could have came down to death without man. So what we've got to understand in stories like this, remember, this is a natural story. What spiritual insight, what revelation can we get from this? That God wants to bring life to people, situations and circumstances. And because you're saved, guess what? You're going to get used to do it. But not if you don't have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Oh, he can't do that. He won't do that. Man, you've just, you just shut the heavens. Yeah. You have just shut the heavens. That's why you have to have these senses this, um, exercised. Be sensitive to what he's speaking. What, what he's doing. Does that make sense? Now, um, go, to, go to Romans. Well, actually, let's go to Genesis 12. That's one story. Here's the other one. And I'm going to hurry up and conclude this because I want to go somewhere. I mean, not after church. I want to go somewhere here. <laughs> yeah, let's hurry up. Because i got places to go, people to see, things to do. Now, the word of the Lord, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1, Genesis. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives to the land which I'm showing you. And I will make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless you and make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in all the families of the earth, um, you shall be blessed. Now, that's what God said to him, right? Now, up to this point, he didn't even know about God, as far as we know. He may have heard about a God, but he had no relationship with God. He was still in Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq at the time. This is what he was called out of. And um, his father worshipped he did not idol. So we, we, don't, we don't have any, any clue that Abraham, as fact, most theologians believe he was a heathen at this time. So whether that's right or wrong, it doesn't make a difference. But he um, gets this promise from God. And somewhere, I don't have it underlined because I wasn't going to go here, where it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Right? Well, that might be 15. Yeah, look at verse chapter 15, verse 6. So God comes to him again in chapter 15 and says some more promises that he's going to do for him. He says, fear not, Abram, verse 1, I am your shield and your reward is going to be very great. And in verse 6 it says, then he believed in the Lord, then he believed in the Lord, and, it, and he reckoned it to him or credited it to him as righteousness. You know what I find interesting about this? Is that it doesn't say he believed in God. And then believed in the word of the Lord. I don't get that. And I never saw it from that angle before. So what do you, you say? I'm, I'm saying what ends up happening with you and me. We get saved. We believe in God. And then we start reading his word. And then we believe in his word. You don't go and believe the Bible first. And then go, well, I guess if I believe this, I've got to believe him. He's the author of it. That's backwards. 
But it doesn't say Abraham believed in God. Now God started speaking and he believed his words. It was like he heard this voice from heaven and he believed the words that he heard, which tells me that we cannot separate God from his word. So Abraham had to stake his life because he has to leave his country and leave his family, everything on something he heard. Now remember Thursday night we talked about how you don't leave your family like that with a prodigal taking everything and leaving, kind of like Abraham did that to his father, if you think about it. Abraham was a prodigal to his father. I'm going to take what's mine, and I'm going to go to a land that God... Now, he ends up taking his dad with him, but that wasn't, that wasn't the original plan. God didn't say take your dad. So he was supposed to go be his own prodigal before God and leave his dad. So it's hard to leave your culture and family in that culture, in that mindset, in that in, in those days. So he had he, he staked every on a land he didn't know existed. Think about it. You're gonna to go to a land you don't even know if it exists. You, there's no maps. You don't have friends and family there that you can say, hey, come visit us, or hey, it's really warm over here. Move, move, this economy's great, move down here. He, he didn't even know, he did not have any physical eyes, did not hear anybody that that land even existed. And he, and he risked everything on something he heard coming out of the sky to him. And so I'm telling you that God is in the business of speaking. That's why he's giving you ears. And in the business of showing you stuff, that's why he's giving you eyes. But they've got to be discerned exercised by the Spirit so you can discern the heavens, discern the Spirit, what the Spirit is doing, not what's going on around and about you. So Abraham had to do that. Now go to Romans 4 because we're going to continue the story of Abraham. That's the, that's the Old Testament account of it. Paul's going to take the same account and um, teach us something here in Romans 4. And go to verse 17. And as it is written, the father of many nations have I made you, he's talking about Abraham, in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, now here's what you see, and calls into existence that which does not exist. He calls those things that are not as though they are. How do you do that? How can you do that? You can't do that with physical eyes and physical ears and a mind that's conformed to the world. Call something that is not as though it is? You can't do that. They'll call you stupid. They'll call you delusional. They'll call you, you're in denial. If you're going to, see, if you go to the heavens and you hear what God is doing, you're going to come back down here on earth and speak it, prophesy, whatever, whatever things we saw there. Now, it's not, it hasn't happened yet. So God's faith is perceiving. Let me bring it to the Amplified because the Amplified nails it on Hebrews 11.1. 1. What is faith? How does faith operate? How do you know if you're operating in faith or not? In Hebrews 11, 1, <clears throat> check this out. I, we've used this a million times, but my, it's just too good to pass up. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see. So, in other words, you have a title deed to, let's say, a house. God's gave you a title deed, but there's no house. No, if you've got faith, if he, you saw something in the heavens, you heard something in the heavens, you saw something, that's your title deed. The minute you see it, that's the title deed. It's yours. It's done. It's already done. So you got a title deed, things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. I've got the title deed, no house, but I got the house. I'm, I have a conviction of this house. It doesn't exist. Abraham, that land, according to him, didn't exist in his own, his own life. Though it did, but it didn't in his life. But God, when God said to him, go to a land, he had the title deed. 
The minute God showed him that land, he got the title deed, though he didn't see the land. Things we do not see in the conviction of the reality, faith, perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. And that's what Hebrews 5 is telling us about. You can't go by your senses. You've got to go by faith. That's why Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by senses. Faith and senses do not combine. Either you're in faith or you're in your senses. Because when you're in faith, those senses have to line up with what you saw and heard in the heavens. And that's how you live. Every aspect of your life is lived by faith. So that means you've got to start hearing God. Amen. That's what I was telling the, the group up there in Clarksburg um, Thursday. You've got to start hearing the promises of what he's doing. You've got to start having your eyes open to what he's saying, your ears, all of that. So that's good stuff there. You can, you can sit on that all day long. But you've got to understand, God's way is... See, we don't call those things that are not as though they were. This is where the faith teachers get into problems. They make it look like, well, whatever you want, you call it into existence. No, you can only do that when your eyes see what he's doing and what your ears hear, what he's saying. Then you can be like Ezekiel and prophesy to whatever. A house, a car, your family, your, your spouse, a church, a people, your business, whatever. He, but you can't just do it because it's a good thing to do. you got to do it because it's a God thing to do. Like, you, you know, I tried it with this church. I tried to prophesy growth. I tried to prophesy that. But I, it wasn't because I heard God. It's because I just assumed, I looked at that tree and said, well, surely God wants a church to grow. Surely God wants me to be prosperous. Surely God wants this, that, and the other. With no, no, without seeing nothing going on in the heavens. This is, what's, this is what's so paralyzing to the church is that's how most of us operate. Because, you know, well, yeah, does God want me healed? Yeah. And we start quoting the scriptures. Does God want me this? Yeah. And we start going. But wait, I want to, I got to see that. I want to, uh, faith comes by what? Hearing. Not watching someone model it. Yeah, they, that guy down there, down the street, he heard God, stepped out, and boom. Abundant life. Now, I'm going to, what, what, what's, what's the jerk reaction to do? Hey, write a book so I can do what you're telling me. Just write a book and tell me five things to do. I'll, and I'll try to do those five things without seeing them for myself in heaven. And God, well, why doesn't God just do that? Because he wants, per, if he doesn't do that, there, we'd have no relationship with God. Right. We'd have a relationship with rules, formulas, keys, and secrets. No, you got to get it the way that God got it from heaven. That's why I'm against most of the book writing that's going on. The how-to books. How to have a big church, how to, how, how to be an evangelist, how to be a healer, how to be the... What? That comes from heaven, not a book. There's a lot there, just in that. So, Abraham believed what God said, not solely believed in God alone. You can't take one without the other. That's why God said, my word is above my name. Faith and grace in the new covenant, the cross, is not a set of rules. Now listen to this. God, God, I had to write this down when, I, when, God showed me, when God spoke this to me. Faith, grace, new covenant, the cross. These are not a set of rules and formulas and secrets and keys, but it's a supernatural experience from a supernatural power working in us. We need the power of God. We, we, we need the spirit of God, which is the power of God. Even obedience can't get these things done. Obedience is not going to give you an abundant life. Because all you're doing is looking at a set of rules and obeying them in your own ability. My ability to do those rules. If all I do is give you rules and formulas and secrets and keys, you're going to go out here and trust in your ability to do those. And there ain't no power in your ability. We can only be successful if the supernatural is working which is by the Spirit in our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no might, no power, and then we're reduced to natural strength with the natural results from that natural strength. And that's where most Christians live. Natural results from their own abilities. And then they wonder why they don't have abundant life, why there's no power. 
So let me close with this, because this, this, is, this, is, this is what God gave me today. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. We know this scripture, but we, met, we, we, we know it so much, these scriptures, we forget the very beginning of it. We don't stop at the very beginning of it. And, um, and I want to read it out of the Amplified, but let's just go ahead and look at it through the, um, this tra the translation I'm reading from today's New American Standard. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, verse 10. Finally what? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The strength of his might. The power of his might. Now, right off the bat, we jump right into the spiritual warfare. Put on the armor of God. We're in the armor of God. We're going against... Get... No, 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 no. Stop. Don't, don't, don't even go any further until you have your eyes open to verse 10. You can't do this without power. And I, I guarantee there are people out there that are trying to Buying this, buying that, yep. in their ability because they know there's armor. Yeah. Having the ability to know that there's armor does not give you the ability to use that armor. Power of God, man. And let me tell you, once the power of God comes on you, that sec that, that, that'll be easy to do the rest of that. Because yeah. it'll be the power of might ushering you into how to use the how, how to war in the spirit realm. But listen to what the Amplified says. Well, I thought I wrote it down. Let me get it real quick. Because it's, it's good. Gives you a little bit better understanding of the Greek of, of that verse. Ephesians um, 6.10. Now this is in the Amplified. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with Him. Well, you know I love that because... Union. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with Him. Draw your strength from Him. That strength which His boundless might provides. You don't want to. You, you don't want to live without power. I'm. I'm afraid that we we're becoming Christians are becoming secular humanists in that it's all about your ability. This is not about, you died on the cross. Your, your abilities died. Your humanity died on that cross. You're a new creation. It's all about the power of God now. Your new creation does not want your flesh, your strength, and your abilities. Are you kidding me? When, it, when it's in union with the Holy Spirit, it's going to turn and say, what can you, get? What can you bring to the table? It knows you can't bring nothing to the table. The new man does not want your abilities. The new man is receiving the power and might of God. And what do we do? We turn to our own abilities, our own humanity, our own flesh. That which God ended on the cross, we keep turning to. Now let me show you something. Exodus chapter 17. This came to me today and I thought, wow, this, that's cool. I'm going to use it. Exodus chapter 17. I'm almost done. Another hour. <laughs> Exodus chapter 17. Let's just let's let's start at verse 8 so you can put the thing in context. Then Amalek, which is the enemy of Israel, came and fought against them. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with a staff of God in my hand. So Moses is going to be on the hill watching Joshua fight. And the staff is going to be in his hand. And Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So there's three guys up there, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. And then Joshua's in the field fighting the Amalekites with his army, with the Israelites. So it came about when Moses held his hand up 
They noticed that every time, I'm going to paraphrase this, they noticed that every time Moses held his hand up, the Israelites prevailed, and when Moses let his hands down, the Amalekites prevailed. I mean, I don't know how long it took them to figure it out, but they saw when Moses would go like this with the staff in his hand, Israel started prevailing. Well, you, how long can you stand there with your hands held up high? Not very long. Sooner or later, they got to come down, and then when his hands came down, the Amalekites started prevailing. And they're like, oh, okay, we see a, we see a trend here. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other, thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So they were. So they said that he can't stand and he can't put his hands up high, so we're going to get a rock, have him sit down, and then we're going to hold his hands up. So Aaron and Hur held his hands up so they could win the battle. Because they realized if his hands go down, we will lose the battle. <laughs> now you think, that's weird. And nowhere else does that ever happen again. You know why God doesn't over, you know, like, well, now we've got to keep his hands up. So Aaron and Hur are now his armor bearers. No, we don't ever read that ever happening again. So why would God do this? There, this is what I'm saying. What, we, we don't even know how to interpret these stories anymore. There are spirit, these stories are spiritual truths. They're earthly stories with spiritual meanings for us. And Romans tells us that. They were not written for them. They were written for us. That we would get encouragement from the scriptures. And that's what we're doing today. What is this? Now, I've heard in leadership conferences that you need, every pastor needs a couple guys that will help him. Okay, to me, that's a physical interpretation to a physical story. Oh yeah, everybody needs help. But that ain't what this is about. Does that also mean that the pastor has to have a rock in the congregation so he can sit on it too? If you're going to take the hands going up, literal, that you need men to hold your hands up, brother, you can't do this on your own. Well then also, I can't do it standing up, so I'm going to have to go find a rock or a chair to sit in. And It's just, I don't, I, I just, that's okay, but that doesn't do anything for my spirit. Might make sense to the mind, Get a few guys around you. That's great. We need it. But that's not what this is saying. You can use it, but I don't think that's what it's saying. What I think it's saying, number one, let's, just, let's go to the rock. That rock, <coughs> rock is always a type and shadow of what? Jesus. The rock he smit was the rock of Christ. The rock, Jesus is called the rock, Right? And so that sitting on that rock means that, number one, you better sit in the finished work of the cross. There's no standing. That's why Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father, because the work is done. You better learn, if you're going to fight a good warfare, you're going to have an abundant life, like we start off with, an abundant life overflowing, you need to learn how to sit in the finished work, which is Christ. Secondly, what is this stand? Who, do I need guys to hold my hands up? Yeah, but that's not what that means. That, to me, Aaron and her, well, I'll show you. Did they not come alongside Moses and help him? What is the comforter called? One who comes along the side to what? Help. Paraclete, or paraclete, however you want to pronounce it in the Greek. Called along. It's expedient for you, Jesus said, that I go away, that the comforter might come. Who will come alongside to help. I think Aaron and her speaks of the power of the spirit. That will cause you to stand. Though you're seated in heavenly places. So that tells me that I have to have the power of God. Resting on me as I'm resting in the finished work. Just can't rest in the finished work. You got to have the power of God. Amen. So I saw that and they went wow. Never heard anybody say that. Never heard any. I always, they always get to the natural. They always give you the natural on that. So anyway, one more scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm saying. You can't surmise that by now. I'll just tell you. You need the Holy Spirit. And I would say to you what he said to his disciples. If you're not operating in the power of God, I wouldn't leave till I got it. Don't leave church without it. Don't leave your home without it. Keep the power of God. It's there given to you to overcome the enemy, the flesh, the world, and the devil. You can't overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil without the power of God. 
This gospel, good news, is the power of God. 1 Peter, this is, we, see, we see these scriptures, but we never really look in. There's aspects of it we don't see. I didn't see that until the Lord showed me this one today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance, which we're going to look at that. To obtain an inheritance. How do you do that? It's, you, 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 there's not a key to open that and just go, it's the power of God bringing it to you. But now watch. Now see, see the inheritance there? Now go to 1 Peter. Or I'm sorry. Was it, where, where, did, Doug, did that take you to the wrong place? Yeah. All right. Backwards. So we already saw that. We now go to 2 Peter 1.3. So we see the inheritance in 1 Peter. Now watch. Seeing that his divine what? Power. Power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Your inheritance comes by divine power. Not keys and secrets and this, that. It's, it's the power of God that unlocks the abundant life to you. You can't get it through natural means. You can't get it through your own ability. You have to get it through the power of God. And, and where, where do you got to be focused? Heaven. Because where does the power come from? Heaven. So let's say, for instance, you're on earth and your natural eyes and ears see something. And then you go to the Father to get it. He says no, but because you're hell-bent on getting it. And because it's good, so it must be God, so you're deceived right off the bat. And you're going to work every ways and means to get that. And you think God is backing you. You think that zeal is God, but that zeal is your materialism. That zeal is not God. That's your flesh wanting something called covetousness. And all the while, we say God's involved. I'm going to tell you something. I, I love the 90%, so I always... Nine, peop, nine people out of ten Christians, nine out of ten Christians live that way. I know it. Because I know they, they, they're, not, they're not exercising their senses. They're not, they're, not, they're not spiritually discerning what God's doing in heaven. They're on earth, and, and earth entices them. It, it's, ooh, look at that. I want that. And we go to the Father, and because these faith teachers told me I can have what I speak. So I'm telling heaven what to do on earth, and God's like, I'm not in that. So I'm now reduced, because I don't know God's not in, I'm deceived. I'm reduced to my natural powers and abilities to get that thing. Like Abraham and Sarah did, which we're going to talk about Thursday. How they went into that tent and out of their own natural abilities produced a son. Because God promised them a son. Does it matter how it comes? He got a son. And God's like, no, that son's not according to promise. Where did the promise come from that he would be a father of many nations? Heaven. He heard that from heaven. So heaven has to perform. Power has to come on Sarah, not natural ways and means. And most Christians don't even know the concept of that teaching. When you say to Christians, well, is that an Ishmael? What the heck is an Ishmael? <laughs> About 60% or 70% of things in your life is Ishmael and you don't even know it. You thought God gave that to you, but your own natural ways and means produced that. Yeah. And it's not going to work. It's going to end up coming back, kicking you in the butt. Or if it's a vehicle, it's going to be a lemon. And if it's not going to be a lemon, it's a good car, he'll make sure you work your butt off to pay for it. Because sweat, remember what the curse of, the, of Abra, or curse of Adam was? That he would live by the sweat of his brow? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the way the new covenant is. The new covenant is rest, not work. So every Ishmael you produce, you've got to work for you got to perform to get it, and you got to work to keep it. But if it's God, He brings it, and you can enjoy it and rest in it. It really is that simple. But, again, you can see why pastors would hate this message, because it would make them sit down, shut up, and hear heaven. And they ain't got time for that. That may mean they can't have their, their ways. That means they have to quit being ambitious about a growing church. 
What if God, is it okay if God doesn't want to grow your church? What if that was the, the call to you? I'm going to give you this church, and, right, and we don't even hear the rest of it. We finish the sentence. Oh, it's going to grow. I'm going to, have big, I'm going to be on TV. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And God's like, you didn't let me finish the sentence. I'm going to give you this church, but it's not going to grow. That ain't God. That's the devil. Is it? You decide. You discern, not decide. You discern. You don't choose. You discern. Well, you got to choose. No, you don't decide and you don't choose. You discern. God, I never, it's not, I, this just came to me. Amen. Think about that. You don't decide. It's not up for you to decide. It's not up for you to choose. It's up to you to discern what the Spirit of the Lord is doing in heaven. And that's what you're going to find happening on earth. Let's pray. Father, I come to you and just open our eyes to this. This is, how it, this is how the Bible, this is the prescribed order of the Bible, how to live, how to have a budget life. It's the Holy Spirit, it's the power of God. We've got to be able to discern what the Spirit is doing. Our senses have to be exercised to discern what's God and what's not God. So open our eyes to this, Lord. No more Ishmael's, no more wasted time. No more wasted money. God, this, this really kills us when it comes to money. No more frivolous spending. What are I'm a steward of this money. What are you doing with it, Lord? What are you doing with it? Uh, we just put it out. What, what we want, we buy. When we want it, we buy. How we want it, we buy. Timing, we ever. It's like God doesn't have a say-so in our money. Everything, every aspect of our lives have to be filtered through the discerning, the exercising of our senses so we can discern what's God and what's not. Not just when we walk in church. No, our whole life is a life of discernment. And we're not about deciding anything. Because if I decide, that was my natural ability of deciding. If I choose, that's my flesh choosing. Nope, I discern. What's God doing in the heavens? And that's what I'll involve myself with. Then I'm the head, not the tail. Then I have abundant life. Only when my senses are exercised. Remember, only the mature are the ones exercising their senses to discern what's God, what's not. The other ones are squandering their wealth, squandering their time, squandering the inheritance like the prodigal did. God mature us in this, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.